That's that one, isn't it? Um, welcome, everybody, to this meeting of the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Combined Authorities Skills Committee. Um, we are a couple of members short at the moment. I'm told that they are on the way. They will be here very shortly. One of them is, I think, stuck behind a lorry, which is refueling or something. <laughs> so I think they will both be here very soon. Um, but I think it's good to start on time anyway. So thank you to those of us who are here. Um, I think we are core at, so we can start with the... Um, standard business, which I hope will not be too contentious. Um, so, um, welcome to those members of the press and public who have joined us today in Huntington, and also to those watching the meeting in our live stream. The Combined Authority allows filming and photography at its public meetings, so feel free to take pictures and use social media during the meeting. Could I ask, though, that everyone present turns their mobile phones to silent or vibrate while the meeting is taking place? There are no fire drills scheduled for today, so if the alarm sounds, I will adjourn the meeting and we will move to the muster point, which is in the high street. And I would like to remind members and officers that the meeting will be recorded. Uh, so we'll move on to part one, which is governance items. And the first um, is apologies for absence and declaration of interest. So with the Democratic Services Officer report, any apologies for absence? I think we've received an apology from Tilly, haven't we? And Peter is substituting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, <quite laughs> it's absolutely fine. Um, it's all right. It's, and luckily, I have it printed out. So thank you, Joe, for the printout. Um, and yes, it's very nice to see you, Peter. I think you used to be our full member anyway, didn't you? So it, it, does, it feels very normal to have you with us. So. Um, does any member wish to declare a disclosable pecuniary interest or non-statutory disclosable interest in any of the items being considered today? Councillor Seaton. Thank you very much. Um, that's great. Uh, some of the funding that's being distributed today also comes to um, Cambridge Skills and Peterborough Skills, but I imagine that that doesn't count as a disclosable interest. They're just it's part of the normal process. Uh, so we will move on to the approval of the minutes and the action log. Um, so if we take the minutes first, um, are there any questions of accuracy on the minutes from any members? I don't see any indications, so I will take that um, as uh, an indication that everybody is happy with the minutes, and I will sign them in a moment, and I will hand over to Fliss to take us through the action log. Hello. There we go. It's working. That's all good. Uh, so just to talk through the action logs, there has been an update to the action log from the one that was distributed. So I'm going to take you through the uh, updated one so that we're in a better place. So the first action has been completed. 79.8 uh, is currently in progress, and this will be distributed shortly. Uh, then the next uh, action, which is open, is 105A and that was to have some information circulated. I believe that Rachel did circulate that. Is that correct, Tamar? Around, yeah, okay, so that's also been completed. And then if we go on to the next open action, that's 107C, um, and again, this has been followed up, but still need to come back to members with um, the information from Growth Works with Skills. Um, so that will follow following this meeting. Um, and then likewise, um, 109A is looking at the data by uh, district. And this again will be circulated following the meeting. All other actions have been complete. Okay. Are there any questions on the action log? I don't see any hands. So that's great. Um, thank you very much, Fliss. Uh, and we will move on to item 1.3 on the agenda, which is public questions. Um, I don't think we've received any questions from the public. We do have some questions from the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, um, which I think we'll take at the relevant points on the agenda, So, um, if everyone's happy with that. Um, so we will then move on to item 2, part 2, item 2.1, which is the recommendations on the adult education budget. Um, so 
Uh, on this one, I do have two questions from the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. So um, would you like to ask those? Uh, should, should, should we introduce the report first or would you like to ask? We'll, we'll have the report first. I think it probably makes more sense. So Paminda, are you there online? Morning, Paminda. Are you happy to introduce the report? Good morning, members. Can you can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Chair, um, and uh, good morning, members. So this report seeks approval and the necessary delegations to allocate funding from the devolved adult education budget, the free courses for jobs funding for level three courses and multiply adult numeracy uh, courses and to sign grant funding agreements with learning organizations. So in this report, I've used the term learning organizations to refer to our further education colleges, local authority providers, and the one specialist designate, designated institution that we um, provide grant funding to, um, to note that a separate report seeking allocations for the independent training provider uh, sector is scheduled on the Skills Committee Forward Plan for June 2023. So this just concerns those learning organizations funded under a, under a grant funding agreement. Um, and this is for the 2023-24 and 24-25 academic years and just to note the nuance on multiply funding which runs on a financial year cycle as opposed to an academic year cycle and the funding allocations are set out in appendix a and equate to 10.3 million of our 15 million available budget so skills committee and the combined authority board authorized multi-year allocations last year but, but last year, the policy was not enacted. But this year, in order to provide surety of funding and stability to the sector, and to help inform capacity in curriculum development, Skills Committee are requested to approve two academic years funding. The second part of the report concerns local flexibilities and the wider national top-down funding changes that are being implemented by the Department for, Department for Education as part of the funding and accountability reforms. And a high level summary is provided um, in, in the appendices to introduce um, banded funding rates in 2024-25. And this is expected to increase funding overall and incentivize delivery of courses in key sectors. Um, plus also changes to the definitions of community learning in order to improve curriculum intent, um, data capture, and also reporting on the impact of community learning. And members are requested to approve the implementation of these policy changes within Cambridge and Peterborough, because of course, as a devolved authority, um, we do have power to deviate from, from national uh, funding rules on, on, our, on our devolved adult education budget. But in order to, 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 um, to prevent the creation of um, um, further complexity in the system, increased bureaucracy for providers, um, it is um, recommended that we, we approve those changes as they are implemented. And of course, we'll work closely with our learning organizations to help them to implement these changes and provide any necessary support um, that is needed to ensure that we have a soft landing for these changes. Given the inflationary pressures on all learning organizations and the decision made by some combined authorities to provide a blanket funding rate incre increase, some analysis was undertaken to look at whether Cambridgeshire and Peterborough could offer, could afford to introduce similar blanket increases of funding rates 
um, across all learning organizations. So for example, in the West Midlands, they've increased rates by, by 10%. Given our flat budget settlement, um, unfortunately, it's not affordable. Um, unless we reduce the participation and reduce opportunities for our residents. And given the financial challenges of delivery um, for our learning organizations, in particular tutor recruitment and retention, um, it is proposed to provide some targeted support. And this is set out in Appendix C. And this would entail doubling of the disadvantaged uplift continuing with all existing flexibilities and increasing the low age scheme so that more of our residents um, are eligible for, for um, upskilling and reskilling and also introducing a new 10% uplift for first level two um, qualifications. These policy changes together with a two year settlement will help to bring additional funding into the system but also target funding to disadvantaged learners and help our learning organizations to, um, to, um, to, to um, continue to, to deliver that world-class education and skills learning offer that we're looking to co-produce with them. And finally, given the increased regulatory demands from our funders, increased caseloads, for example, we now have 25 learning organizations delivering and the need to improve the quality of delivery. We are proposing that the skills committee approve an increase to the top slice that is taken from 3.4% to 5%. And this will help to improve the quality of service that we're able to offer to our learning organization, but also to all of the stakeholders that we're working with on co-design and co-production with additional staffing, um, staffing uh, resource. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, members. Thank you very much, Paminda. Um, so we do, as I said, have some questions from the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Um, welcome, Sam. Um, both Sams, in fact. Um, I think if we take those now, um, Andy, if, if later on you also have questions, do feel free to put your hand up again because I'm happy for that to take place. And um, I, this part of the process is sometimes a bit formal, so it's um, also useful for you to be involved in the, in the wider discussion. Do you want to ask your questions and then I'll give the formal replies? Yes, Chair. Th thank you very much. Indeed. My first question, um, it was one that struck us that we didn't actually know the answer, so it's, it's probably... Um, useful one to ask, which is is how the CPCA tracks the delivery of the funding across all the different providers, bearing in mind some of them are not located within the CPCA area, to ensure that the money is being spent on our students that are residing within the CPCA area. So that, that was the first question based around table B on page 34. Thank you. Um, and the answer to this one is a nice clear one. Um, so the answer is that the combined authority only funds students in eligible capability. Cambridgeshire and Peterborough postcodes tracked through the individualised learner record. All learning organisations funded by MCAs and ESFA must complete an individual learning record as a requirement of funding for each learner. This captures the necessary data for each learner. This data is aggregated into a dashboard which enables, enables the combined authority to monitor and track performance and to provide the learner and geographic analysis that is reported to the Skills Committee and the DfE. Thank you. Yeah, I thought it would be a nice clear answer like that. So thank you very much. My my second one, it draws on various parts of the report. So it's not particularly focused on a, on a page. Um, but um, I think Paminder's dealt with this in part uh, in his introduction as well, which is, can officers clarify how the CPCA will phase in their new funding policy changes with local learning organisations on the new skills fund? Bearing in mind the need expressed by the college to have a blanket increase, which I know Paminder has, has touched on but also the weaknesses identified in the data that we have on community learning. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And the response on that is that the combined authority is fully committed to working in partnership with le learning organisations as per our memorandum of understanding. The challenge of implementing the funding and accountability reforms that the DFA are introducing nationally are acknowledged. 
Officers intend to work closely with our local learning organisations and seek advice and best practice from national bodies such as HOLEX, the LGA Learning and Work Institute and other MCAs to ensure that we have a phased approach that leads to a successful implementation. The outcome we expect to see is a much richer reporting of, le of community learning, both curriculum intent and outcomes that demonstrates the value of this learning to residents and communities. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm just concerned that the, the, the providers are saying they're struggling in terms of the financial situation. And we appreciate that there's not a huge amount of um, joy to come from, from the funding that we're currently providing. But thank you, Chair. Absolutely. And I think that we um, obviously will want to work closely with them in the coming months to make sure that um, we're giving we're aware if they are facing any difficulties and making sure that we're using the budget um, the most effectively. Thank you very much. Um, other questions, Peter? The green light now, thank you. Um, it was a couple of observations, uh, Parminder. First of all, I do agree that the two-year settlement, it, it's nice to have that, right? Um, because I know in local authorities we've struggled in, in terms of getting more than a one-year settlement, so it's good to have a two-year settlement. Um, one of the observations was in terms of the disadvantage uplift. Um, don't, as a representative from, from South Cams, obviously we get a very, very small disadvantage to uplift. So, you know, it's it's very good to see the combined authority really and, and uh, central government supporting Fenland and Peterborough with all that disadvantage uplift money. I think that's very, very welcome. The third thing, uh, maybe for something for the future, is that um, in this area, it would be really good if we could uh, produce some uh, case studies, for, ex for example, where we see, you know, what's happening in practice, because looking at the numbers and the tables and the information, it's very useful. But what would really help me, Parminder, in future is to see some case studies, especially from Peterborough and Fenland, but other areas as well, that show what the what the resources are delivering. I'm sure they're delivering very positive outcomes. It'd just be nice to see that. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have some other questions and then I'll come? Yes. Um. Is it on? Yes. <laughs> Good. Um, yes. Um, thank you very much. Chair, I just um, I was wondering. I mean, I I, I understand the principle that, that Parliament that you've been working on about the two year settlement, which I too think is is very sensible, and and uh, um, the blanket what the blanket increase would do, um, and I'm entirely in favour, of course, of the uh, on the disadvantage point that you make. And may I say that I agree with you the, on the business of case studies. It would be very useful for us all to see to see that sort of thing, which is a sort of qualitative thing rather than a quantitative um, assessment of what's going on. So, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm for that as well. The only, the only thing I would say is, I, um, I mean, obviously all the colleges are having this cost of living crisis like everybody else and every business has. Um, and yet we are planning to put up the money for the combined authority. I think, is it 3.5% to 5% or something like that? And so on the principle that they have got an increase, in, in these things happening, well, so is everybody else, <laughs> is the point I want to make. I just wanted to comment about that because I think it's necessary to. So if I could answer, then I've got another question as well after that, if I could, Chair. Thank you. Paminda, do you want to come back on those two things then, the point that Peter raised about um, uh, having some case studies, which I, I, I think we might come back to at the end, actually, um, and, and then um, Lynn's point about the need for the increase in the top slice. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, um, thank you. Thank you for those um, um, observations and comments, um, councillors. Appreciate it. Um, in terms of the, the the point about the um, the the the, um, the top slice, as I was saying earlier, is it's to do with the fact that we have increased. So our strategy, our skill strategy, is all based on trying to reach deeper into our communities to increase participation and to to increase the the opportunities and the offer that we have and the way that we've done that is through increasing the family of providers that we work with so we've gone from having um, i think it was around 12 or 13 providers to 25 so 
So it's a, a massive increase, a doubling of the number of, of um, organizations that we're working with. And increasingly we're, we're seeing, and we have, has been discussed at Skills Committee, the amount of um, expectations from our, our funders, um, regulators in terms of ensuring that we are compliant and that we are delivering a, um, a quality service, not from just not only just from a funder's perspective, but also from a from a citizen's perspective as well. Um, and we have been um, under resourced for a while. Um, I, I mentioned the the point about that we actually had approval for multi-year funding last year, and one of the constraints that we had in terms of implementation. Was, was to do with capacity. So as part of the wider work that's been done on improvement across the combined authority, um, the proposal is, is, is to build that expertise and build that capacity so that we can provide um, a much better quality of service um, to, to all of our stakeholders locally. Um, and, then, and then a point on, it's very, and, and then um, just to say that I have done some work to look at what other combined authorities structures look like and what their top slice looks like and it, and you can't really make a comparison based on percentage because if you think about for instance um, our closest um, combined authority by size is is um, west of England they, they they get more AB than we do they get um, um, just over 15 million um, versus our 12 million um, and their top slice is 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 four percent, um, and um, they have um, and they have less providers than us as well. So, I think in terms of um, in terms of the kind of service that members would would, you know, from all the conversations that we've been having at Skills Committee over the years, the kind of aspirations that we have for our area, I think we need to to um, to to um, build up those build up that capacity accordingly. And then the second point on, on case studies, just to say I absolutely agree. Um, and there has been some work done in terms of, of compiling um, case studies. Some of these have been published on, on the Combined Authorities website. We've also um, put some forward for, for publications, such as the, the LGA um, reports. We've had some featured there as well. So what I propose we could do is, if members would like us to, is, is to compile all those into one, into one publication, um, which I think would be a very worthwhile um, task to do, um, because it really tells the story of devolution and how, how from the, the perspective of citizens um, and businesses, how we've really made a difference. Um, because as we, we look at the, the quantitative data at Skills Committee, but those sort of lived experiences and real life impact, um, we don't always get to, to, to look at that um, in that way. So very happy to take that forward as an action. Um, and just to note as well is that we, it is a contractual requirement as well for our learning organizations to be providing us with, with case studies as well. Thank you. That was enormously helpful and very good news about the case studies. I think that would be really, really helpful. Um, I think, Lynn, you have a second question. Hang on. <laughs> Thank you for that response, Parmin. And it, it, a little bit more general, so I can see where you're aiming for when it comes to the money for the combined authority. Um, just in the future, we haven't got to forget that. It, there is an awful lot of accountability going on extra for all of the colleges as well. And I, I think I felt I should mention that. Um, anyway, my second question relates to table two and the subject areas, um, which I found very interesting to look through. Um, and it's on page 37. And I just wondered um, 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 how, how these areas are spread through our various colleges and providers because I can imagine, at least I think it would be right to think, that high and specialist must be earning more money uh, than med low and medium. And I just wondered who took those up, because I can, uh, who, you know, who, who is actually um, working, particularly on the low ones, where they get the least amount of money. 
and it would be interesting some some time to just to know um, what people were doing across the county. Raminder, are you happy to come back on that? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll take that one away as a um, as an action, um, Councillor Ayres. And just to note that the in terms of the bandings, those are the national bandings. So locally, we haven't determined what those bandings are. Um, and uh, in my introduction, I, I didn't um, mention about um, essential skills. Um, and nationally, when this new ba banded funding is in, being introduced, um, they're not planning on increasing essential skills. And, and in our skills strategy, it is one of our priorities in terms of addressing the 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 the, the, um, the large volume of of residents who don't have um, any qualifications, um, and to and to focus on basics on essential skills, and that is one of the things that we do want to to increase the funding rates on, um, and to bring that in for next academic year, as as part of our local flexibilities and our local programs. Um, so 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 so, um, so yeah, happy to provide that um, analysis as a separate um, document because, as you can imagine, there's quite a bit of um, analysis that needs to be done uh, me, um, to make that meaningful. Thank you. Ah, now it's on. Um, good morning, Parminda. Um, I know you're aware that the uh, uh, Wisbridge uh, Luff bid was unsuccessful, and part of that bid, uh, there was a proposal for the uh, College of West Anglia for a green construction uh, unit. Um, and I know that the CPCA also uh, were going to provide match funding uh, for construction of a, uh, a new unit. As that uh, bid was unsuccessful, what is the uh, what can the CPCA do uh, to assist in any future development in that area as that love bid was unsuccessful this time? I mean, I'm not sure whether, um, if, if you're able to answer that, that's great. I'm not quite sure whether it comes under this or whether it's possible it might need to come to somebody else. I, I wonder whether Fliss would uh, like to answer, take that one and then I'm happy to... <laughs> to add anything else from a from a, a revenue funding perspective. Okay, I wondered if that might be the answer. Sorry, Fliss. I thought you'd defer to me, Parminder. <laughs> um, so I know that there are conversations happening at the moment, and I believe that I'm due to speak with David soon. So I'm not aware of any additional funds that would meet the value of what uh, Fendon District Council would have received through the LUF bid. However, we recognise there's still a need there, and so we'll continue to have a look at, at whether or not there are any unused LGF local growth funds that could perhaps sit alongside that. But at present, we don't have a solution to, to meet that, that funding gap. But I know that David's been successful in working with external partners to try and draw some additional funds in as well. So it's something that we do want to support if there is funds available. Thank you. Um, and, and I'd just like to echo that. I think that the, the need for that particular, um, for investment in that area is very widely recognised. It's just a matter of trying to work out how we can do it. Um, I'm going to take Liz and then Sam. Yes, that's working. Oh, good morning, Parminda. It's uh, good to see you. Um, yes, I'm in agreement with what everybody else has said, particularly about two years being a much better period of time to try to uh, implement and to uh, determine impact. And it is about impact and outturn that I'm really keen to talk about because uh, we can put on all the courses we like, um, but if we're not able to fill them and we're not able to, to find the relevant people um, to uh, to go on these courses, uh, then we will always have this 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 gap. Um, trying to to work locally, uh, as you know, we do in order to try and to push people onto courses. I still feel that we do not know enough on the ground uh, in our local areas about all that's that's going on, and I would urge that uh, the CPCA works, uh, I know they do work with their economic uh, development and um, 
advisors and managers, and I know that they are all working across the, the districts as a team, um, which is really good. But it's I don't think the information is getting down further than that. And and actually, at, at the meeting, uh, at the management committee meeting, the request was, what do people know about what we're doing on the ground? Well, I had to say very little, I think. So this is a real concern um, that we can do all of this work, we can help the colleges, but what is going to happen on the ground to get those people that we need to get onto those courses? Because we don't appear to be putting money into that end, upwards rather than downwards. Thank you, Perminda. Do you want to respond to that? I can think of some things that are relevant, but again, they're not part of this budget. Um, Perminda. Th thank you, as always, for that question, um, Councillor Everine. And, ju and just to just to um, reiterate the point that you made about working with the um, economic development colleagues across the um, the districts and the cities that that we're absolutely committed um, to working in in co-design um, with them. In terms of um, so, I guess what you're asking is about um, um, resident access. And how do we ensure that that residents understand um, the offer um, that we have? And, um, and and I absolutely agree with you. There's a lot more work that we need to do in terms of in terms of cascading that offer, um, and and to and to keep and to keep banging the drum, and to keep um, increasing the amount of outreach and. Uh, comms activity, marketing activity, but also um, and social media activity, but also um, um, in terms of um, face to face and word of mouth in the community, trying to increase and stimulate that. So we've got some I think we've got some pockets of activity. Um, the multiply bus is a good example um, of something that we've just started. Um, and that's very much, um, I would say, at the early stages of, of being being developed. Um, there's quite a bit of work that's being done in terms of um, getting um, numeracy champions, people in the community. Um, but I, I absolutely recognise there's much more that we need to do. And one of the things that we were hoping um, to, 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 to be able to announce shortly is the work that we're going to do with the third sector in terms of doing that grassroots work um, with community organisations in the community um, to... to um, promote the offer and to provide first steps opportunities and there's a similar piece of work that we need to do in the workplace as well um, in terms of in terms of workforce skills and ensuring that people um, have access to the offer so I guess um, I guess I would say to sort of sum up I would say I absolutely agree with you and agree that there's a lot more we need to do in terms of in terms of reaching deeply into communities there are some green shoots there but but it's something that we need to um, to, to sort of build momentum on um, as we move forward. Just one of those those things from um, that's that's fine. I know I knew it wasn't an easy question to to answer. And if you knew what, if, if we had the answer, we'd we'd be doing it. Um, but but can I please urge that the CPCA and the Skills Committee continues to work actively with the transport because um, and in these camps particularly, it will be local delivery that will work because people do not have the transport to go anywhere else. It's going to become increasingly difficult to get into Cambridge, for example. So all of those things are really important. Important. So transport issues, particularly in Fenland, mm. my colleague, and, and East Camps are absolutely key. Thank you. I certainly recognise that. Uh, Sam. Thank you. And yeah, I, I echo a lot of the comments that have just been made about transport as well. Um, thank you very much for the report, Parminda. I particularly found Appendix C useful, I have to say. Um, I think I often get quite upset about increasing top slicing for things just because it's kind of, it feels annoying to take the money away from kind of the organizations on the ground but I totally understand the kind of logic behind it in this case and agree that it's sort of clearly quite necessary um I was just wondering on page 27 sort of where it references the underspend in the FCFJ program that's led to kind of us having a reduction in funding given to us this year kind of what specific lessons do you think we might have learned from that to make sure that we don't repeat that underspend Sorry, Perminda. I think I think I think it's I think it goes back to the point that I was making earlier about about capacity 
and why we took the decision to increase the number of providers um, so that we can increase the offer and also increase opportunities for residents and mitigate against um, underspend. Because obviously there's no point us going back to the DFE and DWP and requesting new pots of money if, if we're struggling to deliver on, on funding that's been delegated or devolved to us already. So part of the bigger picture work that we've been doing in terms of skill strategy implementation is to have that, um, that local capacity available to us. And I think we're in a much stronger position now than when we were um, a few years ago in terms of having that family of providers um, um, available to us um, and continuing to, and, and that's not to say that we that there's not more work to do in order to build to build capacity, um, as Councillor Seaton mentioned about about specialist facilities being a good example of of where there's a lot more we need to do. So I think I think it's it's to do with and then the the um, the point about engagement and ensuring that all of our learners and our employers are aware of the offer. So to mitigate against underspends, um, I would say the capacity building work that we need to continue with, the engagement work uh, with learners and with employers. Um, and then in terms of the capacity within the combined authority in order to effectively um, administer the programs to the standard that, um, that all of us, including members, would, would, would expect from us. Um, I would say that's, that is the lesson learned. Um, and, and I guess that's why um, we're making these recommendations. You have a look. Yep, great. I don't see any further hands, and I think we've given Paminda quite a good grilling on this one. So thank you very much indeed, Paminda. Um, yes. Um, I, I'm told that Rena needs to come in about the recommendations. So Rena, feel free to speak now. Thank you, Chair. Just um, noted that recommendation D uh, just needs to have some additional wording that says that this delegation is to be recommended to the Combined Authority Board. It's just to add in the words, recommend the Combined Authority Board delegate authority to the Interim Associate Director for Skills to vary grant funding agreements based on performance, et cetera. So it's just, just to add that wording in just for the minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rena. I totally understand why that needs to be there um, and that um, uh, we, we are not able to delegate our own authority, sadly. It would be very nice if we were. Thank, um, you. thank you very much indeed. Um, I haven't heard anyone speak against any of the recommendations, so um, if you're happy to take them on block, I suggest we do that. Um, can I have a proposer and a seconder for these, um, please? Thank you, Peter and Chris. Um, as proposer and seconder, and all those in favour, if you could indicate now. Thank you. I think that's unanimous. Um, so thank you very much, and thank you, Paminda, um, for that. And we will look forward to seeing those case studies, because I do think that would be really, really helpful. Um, and I think we will be wanting to follow up on all the data on that, because it is a very important part of our work. Uh, we will now move on to item 2.2, I think. Um, which is the Careers Hub allocation, Allocations and Future Plans. And I think we're going to Laura to introduce this one. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, members. Um, just introducing to you 2.2, which is our Career Hub Allocation and Future Plans. Um, a few asks for you this morning as Skills Committee. So we're asking you to note the anticipated Careers and Enterprise Company um, grant funding for academic year 23-24. And we're also asking you to make the following recommendations to Combined Authority Board, which is to accept the grant offer upon notification from the Careers and Enterprise Company for the continuation of the Careers Hub. And we expect that to be around 292,000. Um, to accept future funding allocations in addition to our core funding up to the value of 95,000. And this is for additional projects um, that are aligned to our strategic priorities to allocate five months of funding to part fund four of our full-time equivalent posts that sit in growth works with skills from the period of, October, of August to December, 2023. Also to allocate 112,000 pounds of corporate rapid response funding from January 24 until August 24, as growth works funding ceases and UK share prosperity funding starts. 
And finally, to delegate authority to the interim director of skills in consultation with the chief finance officer and monitoring officer to enter into contracts and grant funding agreements. So they are, um, there are the asks of the paper. And then just a bit of an overview in terms of the paper. Um, we receive our careers and enterprise company funding on an annual basis, um, and we have done since 2018. And we anticipate this to be in line with our current funding allocation. Um, just to highlight the funding implications of the delivery of the careers hub and any succession plans following the anticipated end of the growth works funding, which is December 23 this year. Um, and along with the, there is a requirement for us to access the Corporate Skills Rapid Response Fund to cover this provision. Um, we also anticipate there'll be poten potential additional careers and enterprise company funding, which sits outside of that core allocation. We've accessed this, this academic year through a competitive tendering process, um, and it's allowed us to deliver extra work, such as our promoting of technical education, um, and our support in teachers in allowing them to increase their understanding of industry. Um, and our intention is to continue bidding in for that funding over the next academic year, as long as it's aligned to our strategic priorities. Um, the careers and enterprise company contract has sat with the combined authority, as I said, since 2018, and it's allowed us to deliver the enterprise advisor network, which has given a clear link between um, industry and the local labour market into education. In 2021, we were successful with our first um, launch of the Careers Hub. That was extended further in 2022 to include all send, alternate provision and mainstream secondary provision. Um, and that's currently delivered within the wider GrowthWorks contract. Um, it's delivered by GrowthWorks with skills and we fund, as I said earlier, fourth full-time equivalents. Um, beyond the, the period of the GrowthWorks contract, um, funding for the continuation of the service has been identified UK, via the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, which will commence in April 24. But we do have a need to access match funding from December 23, the end of GrowthWorks service, through to the end of the academic year in August 2024. And we're proposing that's done through corporate rapid response funding. We do already have an established budget line um, for this careers and enterprise company contract within the um, midterm financial plan. Um, happy to take any questions and thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you very much, Lorna. Fliss has just asked to come in. So just to clarify, we have not received the money as yet, but there is not another skills committee until June. And so therefore, rather than going out of committee to get approval to go into this, we are asking for this in advance of us receiving that funding. Thanks, Fliss. Thank you, Fliss. I have to say, um, this whole paper brings home to me, yes, again, just the complexity and the kind of short-term nature of so much of our funding. Um, and I know that mayoral combined authorities across the country are asking for more consistency and more long-term funding from government. And this paper just um, kind of heavily underlines how helpful that would be because the juggling about all these different funds and trying to, I mean, these are people who are employed, whose um, employment we are trying to continue, but its it requires quite a lot of, um, yeah, uh, recommendations to us in order to enable something to just carry on happening, which doesn't seem entirely helpful. Um, Liz. <laughs> I, I just, uh, I have got a question, but I, before I, I, I put the question, I'd just like to say that I totally support this uh, because uh, in these camps, particularly, I don't know the others, we really see the impact on the ground here for the work that's been done by the Careers Hub, all our careers uh, coordinators are all involved. The EA scheme is incredibly uh, successful. Our businesses are, are all uh, very keen to to join with us. So, so thank you. Um, uh, Laura, because this this is really beginning to to bite on the ground, and we're really pleased. Particularly, as I have to say, that uh, generally we're losing um, careers coordinators; they're leaving their current jobs. We don't have trained ones to to fill in. We don't have the funding to train them, and so we're back in the full circle process that we were before Opportunity Fund came along. <laughs> which is where we were. Um, the question was that you have introduced uh, the opportunity. For, uh, because you want your 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 careers hub to to support naught to I don't know 
to 19, 25, 35. Uh, but you've introduced uh, the opportunity for the primary schools to be involved in uh, setting out a, a, a careers program. And you're, it's a pilot and you're asking for it. Is this going to, this funding, is this going to enable more primary schools to be involved so that we can get that run up in through schools from right right from the young age and the interesting careers that's so so needed. Am I okay to answer? Um, yes. So thank you. So um, the core funding sits outside of primary school education. That our core funding is for um, secondary provision through to FE. In terms of the additional funding, we don't have sight at the moment as to what additional funding projects are going to come out um, over our um, next academic year. Um, however, anything that we can that, that leads into primary school education, we absolutely will be tendering in for. And that sits outside of um, careers and enterprise company funding as well. If we identify anything um, in addition to, to, to the, the careers and enterprise company funding, we will be bidding for that. So at the moment, no, but we are on being part of the trailblazer. It is enabling us to have an evidence base for any future funds, but also to be front and, front and centre, if you like, with um, any CEC funding that may come around for additional primary school. Sorry, can I just add on? So when we agreed, sorry, Laura, when we agreed to be part of the trailblazer for primary, one of the things that I said at the get go was that we can't just start and stop. And so therefore we are having those advanced conversations with, with the CEC to, to carry on that discussion in the fact that it can't be short term. If we're starting that, we need to be able to continue. Yes, Lynn. Yes, can I just, just say that, um, and I, and I don't know where this, how this happened, but in Peterborough, I do know that um, the cabinet advisor, who you, some of you know, uh, Councillor Bisbee, comes up. He he actually attended a primary school where they were discussing future careers, and he came back thoroughly enthused by it, because the children absolutely loved it, and they were sort of years um, seven and eight. I think it was he went to and and it went on for about an hour or so and they were he couldn't believe how how much they enjoyed it so yes the more we can get for primary the better <laughs> thank you um very good feedback I imagine you mean they were um aged seven and eight because years seven and eight are in secondary school <laughs> but um uh, thank you I don't see any further questions on this and I haven't heard anybody speak against it. So again, could I have um, a proposal and a seconder? Thank you, Sam and Liz, for that. And all those in favour, if you could indicate now. And again, that's unanimous. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we will move to item 2.3, uh, which is being introduced by Louisa. Good morning. Can everybody morning. see me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Louisa. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chair and uh, councillors, uh, for inviting me to attend. Uh, I'm going to present the UK Shared Prosperity Implementation Plan paper. Um, it has uh, a skills emphasis, but the skills emphasis comes later uh, in terms of funding. Uh, it comes in our 24 to 25 uh, financial year funding, uh, but the rest of the uh, projects are delivered from this financial year onwards. Uh, we're looking for recommendations to the um, Combined Authority Board for approval of the implementation plan with delegated authority to the Executive Director for Economy and Growth for uh, items set out in 3.3, which relate to um, underspend for this year being carried forward into the next financial year and, um, and a potential increase in the administration uh, fee uh, to four districts to cover 
uh, administration of the Rural England Prosperity Fund, which is a fund that has come from DEFRA with no administration fee. Um, otherwise, those districts will be uh, administrating the fund uh, from their own reserves uh, or from funds from the Shared Prosperity Fund. Uh, we're also looking for uh, delegated authority um, to support minor changes that may occur during the lifetime of the implementation plan. Uh, we've set out those changes within Appendix 1A, and there is also some guidance provided in Appendix 1B, which is the guidance we've been given from um, DLUC. Uh, in terms of minor and major changes and changes that they will need to be advised of and changes they're happy for authorities to move forwards. Um, we're also <laughs> looking for delegated authority uh, to enter into grant funding agreements with each of the districts uh, for the associated projects set out in the implementation plan. In terms of uh, UK SPF, um, we have worked with the districts and the unitary authority uh, to develop the projects over uh, about four months now. We submitted our investment plan, which was approved by DLUC, and we've made some minor changes um, to make best use of the funding uh, in terms of some partnership working across some of the districts for delivery of two projects. And uh, we've had um, one project withdrawn, um, which uh, funding has been moved into another project within the district. So all of the districts have worked hard with ourselves to get to this point of the implementation plan with the outputs and outcomes as set out in the appendix that we've shared with you. Um, we're looking for delegated authority uh, in order that we're able to continue to uh, work the programme of projects. There's a significant number of projects. We've got 36 um, projects in the districts and we have three skills projects that um, are delivered in the last year of SPF that Fliss and her team are working on. Um, there are uh, a number of uh, projects that are very specific within the districts. They're quite small, but are meeting um, needs that have been identified there. We've got, we haven't had um, approval of the uh, rural fund yet. We've uh, sought, um, advice from DLUC and DEFRA and are still waiting for approval of the uh, rural fund which sits within four of the districts so we will be bringing uh, an amendment to the implementation plan once we have uh, approval of the rural fund. Um, the paper sets out how we've delivered and how we've worked with the districts uh, and how we are um, sharing the administration fee that we have currently, which is 4% of the fund, um, to cover various pieces of work that the districts have to do and that we have to do in order to meet the uh, minimum requirements of DLUC in terms of the returns. Uh, happy to take any questions. Uh, hopefully we've set out in the paper uh, information that uh, answers any of your queries. Thank you very much, Louisa. Um, Sam, no problem. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's all really helpful. Um, as the executive portfolio holder uh, for most of the SPF stuff at the Huntingdonshire District Council end, um, certainly the uh, approval to move forward with um, finalising agreements with districts is going to be very welcome, enabling us to um, uh, make make further headway at that level. So, so I'm very supportive of this moving forward with with with, with maximum haste. Um, I was also going to ask if if you'd uh, heard 
anything further you're in a position to share with us around expectations management on rural fund confirmation from DLUC. But yeah, you've rather um, <laughs> that. Uh, and it sounds Sorry. like it's no, but um, uh, uh, th thank, thank you anyway. But no, other, other, otherwise, uh, I think that was helpful. I don't have anything further, uh, lest, it, lest it delay us moving on with it. Thank you, Lynn. I think I'm beginning to sound a bit like a stuck record on this particular point because you, many of you have heard me complain before that Peterborough is not a district. And here it is again on pages uh, 80, I'm not, I mustn't say again because it's different this time. On page pages 86 and through, we're called a county council, which we're definitely not. We are a unitary authority. And can I, I'm, I'm, I have to keep making this point because I accept entirely that it's quite, it is a bit confusing because we're treated very much in the same way when it comes to funding as well with the district councils and when you want to talk about us in bulk. But anyway, I just thought I should make the point that we are a unitary authority. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to make a similar point to um, Sam, which is, um, you know, from a South Cam's point of view, we put quite a lot of thought in into this. I know um, that when the CPCA officers, I know that, uh, Louisa, when you were working with our officers, we were trying not to reinvent the wheel across uh, the districts. So looking at the various programmes, I think a lot of that has been achieved. Um, our focus, as you see from the summary table at the start, has been on communities and business support rather than necessarily on skills. And that's just because we felt we could deliver this, some of the skills work through the business support work, if that, if that makes sense. Um, so, uh, like Sam, uh, eagerly awaiting the rural fund decisions. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Liz. So I just wanted to say, I just wanted to say, uh, I, I appreciate the amount of work that everybody's done with this. It wasn't a, an easy process to go through, and it was very quick. Again, um, but we did sneak a couple of skills things through, which is really, really good. And I'm really, really pleased uh, that uh, we've been working with other districts in order to work with the BIPC, which is one of the, um, uh, the county council services, which has been working really closely on the ground with our, our local skills people and, and businesses. So I'm really pleased about that. So it's not a question, it's just a thank you. Asha. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I don't see any further hands. Um, sorry, there was indeed a question from ONS on this. Apologies. <laughs> I saw it at the beginning and then I forgot. Um, so, yes, Councillor Calls. Thank you. There, there are two questions which relate really to page 51, uh, table 2.5 and 2.6. And, and I suppose it's um, what you've learned from going through this process. On uh, table 2.5, there's quite a variation between the different um, districts, the unitary and uh, indeed the CPCA uh, results. And my question was, could you officers confirm that the variation in spend between the regions is based wholly on need and not on the constituent authorities' officers' abilities to better exploit the bidding process? And whether there's any learning to be had as a result of this process that might improve the um, bidding capacity across the CPCA area and all the constituent councils? Thank you, Chair. So the answer on this one is extremely brief, which is that the funding allocation was set by central government and was based on the 2011 census data. Um, I suspect that could be improved on, but that's what the answer is. Yes, I think we, we have had another census, so no doubt that might be changing things for next time. I don't know if you can answer that one, please. Yeah, so I, I can, I can. well, unless, Louisa, you wanted to go more. So therefore, the decision was taken uh, that the allocations given by government would be the allocations that were administered through the combined authority. So there were indicative allocations that were published when the UK SPS prospectus came out. And so it was based purely on those uh, initial um, indicative allocations rather than the strength of bidding teams within individual authorities. And so that was a decision that was made, I think, at the combined authority board to take that process forward this time. 
Um, and then it was also the agreement that we would take forward some strategic combined authority wide projects. And that's why we have the three skills projects so that we could have more of a strategic focus rather than just um, smaller projects within local authorities. Um, I think, I mean, I, I think there is an important point for us here. Um, it's a point that lo local authorities across Cambridgeshire make year after year after year, that as one of the highest growth areas in the entire country, um, if central government is basing our funding allocations on census data from 2011, we will be heavily underfunded because it doesn't take account of our population growth in that period. Um, and um, it, it's, it's a point that I know all of our constituent authorities make consistently and government consistently fail to do anything about it um, but it is worth making clear that um, that is frustrating and irritating again sorry back to the um, questions from ONS thank you chair my, my second question was on the next table table 2.6 and I was just a little bit flabbergasted it's 400,000 pounds of admin to deal with 9 million pounds and 38 projects um, and, and for the split being 50-50, when there are four um, skills projects um, and the, just a few joint projects, um, I think Councillor Carly mentioned about um, concerns about top slicing and whether it's valid or not, and he was confident with the 35 to 5% on the other paper. I just would love to be more confident on this and have some clarity on what these administration costs are spent on. It does seem quite a lot. Thank you, Chair. So um, the official answer on this is the administration costs are split across the district authorities and the combined authority to allow for governance of the programme of projects, carrying out appropriate due diligence and best reviews of proposals. Once projects start delivering services, it allows for the collection of data and submission of central government returns, and then it allows for the evaluation of projects and the programme overall in terms of delivery against outputs and outcomes. So that's the official thing. Um, I'm going to make an unofficial comment, which is that um, if you, this, this again, I mean, we're back to the funding mechanisms and that actually if you set up funding where there are lots and lots and lots of different individual projects being delivered by different individual councils and, and then they have to make a whole bunch of, fund, of returns against all of those comparatively small projects to central government, I can see why the administration costs are perhaps higher than we might like but it's possible other people may have a different thing to say. <laughs> if I could just um, follow up that, I, I just think it'd be nice to know if that's all going to be spent on individuals' hours to deliver this or whether we're actually investing in automated services to make sure as much as possible that everything can be entered once and dealt with according to plan and not have to waste time, valuable staff time on just um, doing spreadsheets. Do you have an answer for that, Phyllis, or, or does or Louisa, actually? I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to um, add um, to anything that Fliss might have, but um, in in answer to that question, currently we have no automation within um, data collection and performance management. It is something that the uh, combined authority are looking at with some urgency. Um, we are really keen, really keen to see automation where at all possible. Currently, there will be um, a minimum spend on people's hours collecting the data. A significant amount of the spend has been on ensuring that the projects, projects offer best value. So we've been we've carried out not only a due diligence assessment of the projects, but we also have carried out um, a, a high level best value review of the program. But we've also had to um, and will have to spend quite, um, quite a significant portion of the administration fee um, doing subsidy control um, assessments on some of the projects, which where we don't have that specialism within the legal teams internally, we're having to actually externally um, seek advice on that. Um, subsidy control obviously changed. Uh, from state aid quite recently so a lot of people and a lot of the legal teams are on on catch up so it's 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 taking up quite a lot of time and um, funds ensuring that these projects are all established and correctly um, 
sort of set up in the first place in terms of governance and that the subsequent collection of data uh, we unfortunately initially will be um, heavily people reliant but hopefully uh, moving forwards will be much more automated and I share your um, your your uh, wish to have as much automation as possible having administered a number of these central government funds. Thank you very much, Louisa. That's very helpful. Um, I don't see that anyone else feels the need to add anything, so, but, but they're very helpful questions from OV and Scrutiny. Thank you very much for those. Um, again, I don't see any further hands, um, and I haven't heard anybody argue against uh, these recommendations um, other than some reservations about the process by which we got here. So um, if I could have a proposer and seconder again, that would be very helpful. I've got Sam and Peter this time as proposer and seconder. So have you got Councillor Wakeford and Councillor McDonald to propose and second and all those in favour? Lynn, are you happy to support this? <laughs> you <laughs> then that's unanimous also thank you very much indeed louisa um and we'll thank look you forward to having updates on those coming back regularly absolutely thank you very much thank you we now move on to item 2.4 which is the finance and performance report which is bruna i think yes. hello nice to see you all hi uh, thank you nice welcome nice to see you again uh so let's uh, so hope you can see me the home is a bit dark but Okay, so finance report for this uh, uh, quarter. As you can see, the report is based, so, so sorry, the, the ask for this paper have to note the financial position to the end, uh, to the, to January, up to January, and a recommendation, recommend to the combined authority board to approve the merger or the free budget line that are the AB innovation funds revenue, the AB provider capacity building, and the AB strategic partnership develop, um, development. So in regards to the financial position, um, in, uh, we can see that the budget set up for this year on revenue income, and in, in income it was 19.7, 19.8 million pounds, of which we receive 13.8, that's me, 13.9, sorry, which means we have a variance of 5.9 million. These, the majority of the variance is due to uh, skill boot camps. So 4.1 million out of the 5.9 is skill boot camp, which we have discussed way free, to which we have discussed in at length in many other meetings before this. But um, overall, we say that uh, this is related to lack of fun, uh, fun you know, Funding uh, so the process to find this, uh, the students it was longer than required so we actually have less uh, people taking taking part to this that we were expecting up to now which means we can actually claim less money and uh, so we have a lot of smaller cohort as well the other half the other big side of the the variance is the G digital school. Uh, School camp, uh, sorry, the digital skill boot camp. That also this is um, this is partially due to the tardiness of the claim from the FE, but also expecting to have a lot of variance due to performance. All things that we already discussed in the past, nothing particularly um, controversial, I would say, because we have spoken about it in the past. Uh, in relation to cost, we can see that our budgeted cost is 22.8 million, of which we spend 12 and 13 million pounds, which means we have a difference of just shy of 10 million pounds on to date. So we had to spend nearly 10 million still. In relation to the out the outfall, so um, in relation to the forecast, our outturn. We're actually expecting to spend 15.5 million with a variance of 7 million, 7.2 million. So the main differences here, they are again, the still boot camp, uh, skill boot camp that I was speaking, I was mentioning before, the healthcare uh, sector academy, work academy, nearly 2 million pounds. Again, very known issues that we have in this area. 
and the digital school camp. So we already spoken about all of these. In relation to AB, AB accounts for 1.6 million of the variance. Um, part of the variance is due to a, the, devol the devolution program, so 383,000 pounds. Uh, that's um, uh, that uh, we had a slippage in the accounts, so this activity will take place next financial year. Um, like 532 of it will go in next financial year. Free cost for work, in which the, uh, the project that was originally planned to start in August actually start in October. And then you have the innovation funds revenue, the provider capacity building one, and the partnership and development one, which are uh, delay delayed to next financial year due to uh, ta uh, capacity issue of the team. Um, yes. In relation, uh, just to add, in relation to the devolution program, so the main AB project, you can see the variance to date is 383, but we're expecting to be lower by the end of the year of half a million. The reason with it is that we have actually get, we are go we're going to have some payment back from the grant provider that they didn't perform. As, as, expected, as expected. Last thing to mention is the request to measure the budget line. So the request come um, on the principle that this will allow the for streamlining of processes and ensure that uh, um, the, the team will have more resources available to uh, complete the activities. This will, of course, not um, stop us to perform at the best of our ability all the time actually uh, help um, um, taking away any potential du duplication of activities um, because it's easier to manage if you have only one. Um, overall value of the pot is around five and, is £537,000 for next financial year. So we are expecting to implement this for next financial year, of course, considering that this is pretty much ended. Uh, that's all. I mean, then there is the performance reporting. And, and you see the performance report in the hands in the other in the attachment. So if I've you know, if you have any question up here. Thank you very much indeed, Bruno. Um Sam. Thank you. Um yeah, so I just had one specific question which was about the um the outstanding claims with the Department for Education. I was just wondering what our position is likely to be. And once those come through, I think you said there's going to be there's still likely to be a large variance in performance. I'm just wondering if perhaps you have any idea of more specifically what it's likely to be once all the outstanding claims are dealt with. So, sorry, you mean uh, are you referring to the idea that the income is not being recognized, uh, received fully, or you're uh, thinking about that we haven't spent all the money? So I'm just talking about the digital skills boot camps. That bit, okay. the funding there. Yeah, then we will, we will, we will be in line with what we were expecting to spend. So the digital skill boot camp is expecting to spend. Um, where is it? Um, it's in the table below. Uh, so we are expecting a variance of three point four million. No, oh, sorry. What a second, 1.2 million, that is what is in the forecast of her. Bruno, I think Fliss is happy to help if that's... Sorry, right. apologies, Fliss. It's totally fine. Fliss. So in terms of the digital skills boot camps, we will be returning quite a significant amount of money. However, in terms of the number of learners who actually were recruited on programme and undertook learning, we were less than 200 short. The problem being that because boot camps is new provision, providers didn't collect all the evidence that they needed for us to be able to make payment to them. So we have delivered a lot more than what the funding suggests. So it's, um, it, it's, it's a very, very tricky model uh, for delivery, but the actual financial performance is worse than the actual delivery performance, but unable to pay providers for not having a clear evidence trail. Can I, can I just follow up on that? Does that mean that, um, sorry, this is not necessarily, this is, uh, 
Um, does that mean that, uh, that a number of providers who have provided that will have provided learning for people that they will not get paid for because they're not able to um, fill in the right forms at the right time? And is that therefore going to make it more difficult for us to persuade providers to undertake these programmes in the future? So this is in relation to one provider who delivered a lot on the first, but they have come back to deliver on wave three. So it's, okay. um, yeah, it's a learning curve. Yeah. Cool. However, we can't, we can't pay because DfE will not pay us. So thank you. Um, the other Sam. Um, Thank you. Uh, I was on the, the, the same topic, but I'm, I'm just uh, digesting the implications of that uh, previous answer. The, the, the simpler question I was going to ask was, was just um, in 3.3 3, um, number two, which is the second paragraph at the top of page 93, um, where it says the Digital Skills Bootcamp uh, underfunding uh, against budget reflects the tardiness of claims in the system. I think it was suggested in presentation that that was part of the factor, but also um, numbers uh, uh, in the delivery of the program were part of the factor as well. So just just to make clear that it wasn't um, implying that that was the full explanation. However, the explanation we've just had now would seem more useful to amend into there for the uh, board's benefit, particularly as the volume of uh, material they, they they have to wade through to, I think, interpret that. Otherwise, would be would be difficult. Um, uh, and I was likewise. Uh, going to ask off the back of the, that clarification kind of where what the consequence of that underspend uh, is in terms of the, the the providers for us forwards but you've you've given reassurance there um uh, i think as much as we might hope for it um around uh, a, a, a lack of knock-on impact going forward on this but um uh thank you for thank you for unpacking that to be on the paper thank you um liz I was just going to ask the question about the Health and Work Care Academy, um, because um, Lynn and I were at a, at a meeting where we, we were told that there were issues about whether anybody starting just before the end of the programme could continue or not, and which was leaving everybody right up in the air. But I understand there has been a resolution on that, which doesn't appear in this paper. I think that there, we have actually received confirmation that that um, clients can start right up to the end of the contract and continue to finish their courses um, and, and develop providers will be paid. I have to say how we've been on two occasions, we've been held up, up to ransom over things like this, which is very unsettling for providers and for or people and clients. And um, I just wanted to register that, that this is really, really difficult for when you're trying to deliver a programme when you actually don't know what the conditions are. So that is correct. And I think paper's deadline was prior to the information from DWP. So yes, to confirm that uh, the Health and Care Sector Work Academy can enrol learners up until the end of March. So therefore, we have that additional time and discussions are underway between colleagues at the Health and Care Sector Work Academy and within my team to look at how we can continue to fund now that we know that there is momentum behind the Health and Care Sector Work Academy. So also looking at a, a sustainable uh, offer in this space as well. Just make it come back on that. Um, what we watched on this programme is how long it took to get this off the ground. But it wasn't, it wasn't about that what people weren't there, but the whole style of how you can create the opportunity for these youngsters is not about advertising. It's you have to go out and physically get these clients. And that's worked, hasn't it, for the Health and, uh, and Work Care Academy. And there's a lesson, I think, to be learnt for all the other um, uh, courses which are not haven't attracted enough people. There are people out there. It's just the, how you go about getting them. Thank you. Um Sam, go on. Uh, sorry, I'm maybe jumping ahead of Councillor Hayes, but uh, on on the same topic, I, I, I think um, three point six Roman one. So um, starting at the very bottom of page ninety three, um, I think 
that's one nine three, isn't it? Um, uh, makes I think the same point about the school spook count wave three monies the change in um, time scales on uh, in terms of whether courses must be complete or simply started by March twenty three. Um, and I mean, you know, there's a, a, a I think heavy understatement in the um, final. Uh, sentence of that paragraph uh, around feedback provided to DfE about the benefits of a multi-year contract um, that, that we could have rather than one-year contracts. I, I didn't quite quote that verbatim, but um, uh, I, I think making the same point, um, you know, conscious as in many of these things, uh, we are we are in the hands of the whim of central government, um, uh, and, and and feedback from us um, may or may not be. Uh, uh, impactful in in asking them to behave what what feels to us more reasonably and rationally but um uh, is there anything further or any more robust way we could provide that feedback i suppose is the is the question um because i mean that's relevant to other items we've talked about today as well um uh, and and you know less money could be spent on the admin and, and 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 working around this as we're all very clear and more of it actually is more efficiently for what it's what its intended purpose are if um uh if if, if goalposts were um you know appropriately flexible at the beginning did uh were informed by input and suggestion from combined authorities and, and all of that thank you i'm going to come to lynn and then i'm going to say something and then i'll come back to you Fliss. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to say, actually, that, uh, that it has been quite extraordinary how all of a sudden, I think, in, this, in the academy working, they suddenly um, are getting people wanting to do it. Um, and it's right at the very end of the project period. And they, had to, and they were then told that, they, that actually they would not get no more money beyond March, which was, of course, quite... Anyway, that's all being overcome, as Liz has just, has just said, which I'm we're very delighted about because they are getting more. And may I say that most of the people I think that are coming in now are coming in through social media. That's but that's the, been the, the, the big eye-opener as opposed to putting things in newspapers, putting these anywhere else at all. That seems to have been very successful. So probably not too surprising as well for, for you young people. <laughs> 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 but can I? Would you mind if I just raise the point about on, which I always do raise the point about these rag ratings at the end here? Um, and I just want I looked at multi. I understand them all, and I understand why the, the one above it is red. But the multiply. Can could I ask why multiply is on red? Um, because I thought because bearing in mind I know how popular it is in Peterborough, um, I thought I should ask. Well, is it popular elsewhere? So whilst we were talking, I also I was unaware it was on red and I probably shouldn't admit that. But the reason being is because we had to provide our first return to DfE before Christmas. Um, and at that point, we were behind profile. However, there's been significant activity in this calendar year. And so I hope that we will we will move away from red. Thank you all. Um, the, the thing I wanted to suggest that we perhaps might want to do as a committee is ask um, Fliss and Bruna and the team, um, probably probably more the wider team than the finance team, actually, to have a look at. The, I th so I think there are three specific things, and I may be missing one, where we are actually under-delivering. There are... There are um, there are some things where the funding is just coming in a different pattern, and um, but but I think there are three specific areas where we have underdelivered. One of those is wave three boot camps. One of those is the health and care sector, and the other one is the digital skills boot camp. Although that may be slightly different, I wondered if it would be useful for us as a committee to ask for a, a, a kind of deep dive into all of those um, projects to look at what went wrong and what went right and what we can learn in the future, which then potentially might allow us also to feed that back on Sam's point to central government, were they happening to be interested. But it, but even if they weren't, actually, it would probably be useful for us to, to get some really clear understanding about um, the things that worked and the things that didn't work within those schemes. So if the committee um, think that that would be a useful idea, if we could put that on our agenda um, I don't. I don't know what our June um, agenda looks like. It could come in September. I just think it would be a good piece of work for us to do. Agreed. 
that just two points on that. So I think including that, but also mitigations already put in place because um, there are things that we've already started, especially for wave four. And then with the Health and Care Sector Work Academy as part of that programme, there is an external evaluation by Hatch, I think, Regenerist. And so therefore it might be worth waiting to get the wider external evaluation of the programme. But I'll, I'll check with Pat to find out when that's due. Um, but definitely agree on both points. Thank you. That's great. Um, I, I don't think we need to change the recommendations. I think we can have the recommendations as they are, but that will be in the minutes and can be added to the action log. So that's, everyone's happy with that. I haven't heard anyone speak against the recommendations. Um, so if we can take the recommendations um, as suggested, uh, can I have a proposer and a seconder? Thank you, Chris um, and Sam, Carling. Um, and all those in favour, if you could indicate. Thank you. That's, again, unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, and we will move on to growth works. Um, and Steve is unfortunately not able to be with us this morning. So I think, Fliss, you're introducing this one. I am. Apologies. I did think Domenico might be on the call as well. But maybe not. OK, um, so it's over to me then. <laughs> yeah. So apologies for the brevity of the introduction to this report. So as we uh, every other uh, skills committee meeting, we receive a report on the update of performance for growth works. So the paper that you have in front of you uh, covers performance for the whole of year two um, and so has the annual review. So if we start on the positive points first, uh, for the year two, we are ahead of target on committed jobs. So therefore, the programme delivered uh, 2,201 committed jobs against a target of 2,069. Uh, due to some additional capacity and capability of the growth coaching service, we also saw a solid end to their year in terms of their performance. Inward investment, again, also exceeded their annual targets for both uh, jobs and also for uh, new pipeline companies uh, looking to relocate to Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. The area where there continues to be concern uh, is around growth works with skills and the targets that they have managed to achieve. We have appointed within the combined authority a new programme manager to work very closely along with the Growth Works team, and they are now on a performance improvement plan as well. Um, we have seen, moving on from the end of year two, in the start of this year, we have seen an increase in performance. However, it is still quite disappointing. Um, the focus for them is around their ESF targets. If we talk in terms of uh, actual technical terms, their CO23s and RO9s, um, and we have seen an increase uh, so far this calendar year, uh, but recognise there's still work to be done. Um, we work very closely with them. Um, you'll also see the breakdown by district uh, of all targets, and that's something that uh, Whilst we'd expect to see uh, some significant outputs in some areas due to the relative need, it is also concerning for us at the combined authority that there isn't more of a fair distribution of targets across the area. Uh, I can only speak for Growth Works with Skills, but somebody has been appointed to every district or unitary uh, authority area to therefore ensure that targets um, are completed across the whole of the area. Um, I'm not going to go into any more detail in way of summary, but I will do my best to answer any questions that anybody may have. And I believe there's an, is there an ONS question. There isn't. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Fliss. I know you have had to step in and present this at short notice, so we are very grateful to that for that. Um, I also should have pointed out that there is an appendix to, to this report, which is exempt from publication because it contains information relating to the financial or business affairs, um, which is exempt. Um, if anyone wants to discuss appendix two, we will need to go into confidential session and we'll move that to the end of the agenda. But I suspect we can probably have most of our discussions without going into an exempt session. Um, and I do have a question from the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, which we will go to now. 
Chair, thank you very much. This seems to be my, my, my least popular thing to comment on because I always seem to be so um, depressingly negative about it, and I try not to be. But um, a year ago, I was promised um, much greater figures, and, and I was really looking forward to seeing um, some concrete uh, qualitative results. And I have to say, it's not quite what I was expecting. The, the figures are much better. They're still not good enough, and I think um, Chris was very clear about that. Um, but my question, I, I've, I've phrased it deliberately broadly, bearing in mind that there is an exempt appendix. I didn't really want to go into great detail in open session. But um, my question is that the Growth Works report includes many different metrics, but no evidence to prove the quality of the training or concrete measures of how the training has improved things. I can go into further detail if you wish, but are we likely to see that information in the future was my question. So I'll read the formal response and then we'll see whether um, there's anything more we can say. So, um, yes, we are in dialogue with GrowthWorks around how performance data and metrics are presented going forwards, especially around district reporting. GrowthWorks with skills do not themselves provide training and act as an honest broker to training providers already operating in the combined authority. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yep. So a couple of additional points. So we're currently the business board are currently commissioning a review into the Growth Works contract, and so therefore there'll be an independent review, and so therefore the output of that that review will show you a lot more detail and hopefully the quality information as well. We do have a list of every learning outcome that has been undertaken as part of the Growth Works with Skills contract. So that is something that is available. Happy to share. Not sure we need that needs to be public, but more than happy. So we do have that detail. And in terms of the quality of the outputs, because they're all through existing training providers, it's it's not it's not additional training. So therefore one would expect the quality of the provision to be along with all the external quality measures as well and there are again it is a good point going back to the case studies there are many case studies from growth works with skills as well and so therefore along with AEB skills boot camps careers health and care sector work academy that's something that we do need to bring to life so you can see the impact that these programs are having Thank you very much. Um, again, it's um, the overview and scrutiny scrutiny of this is very welcome, and I think it's been really helpful to have your um, continued questioning on this. So thank you, Sam, uh, Wakefield, and then Colin. So, thank you. I, I think this, this is pr probably anyway um, beyond the scope of uh, useful discussion here, beyond flagging, but certainly uh, uh, particularly in, in light of um, this presenting at short notice. But I, I think that there's reference in the report, um, a single reference to the to the uh, the CRM um, system that GrowthWorks uh, use, HubSpot, uh, simply in the um, uh, in the glossary, but um, not, not, not discussed elsewhere. Um, you're probably aware that one of the long running challenges from um, economic development teams in the district has been uh, across the districts and the unitary uh, and the city, as Captain Reyes rightly, rightly corrected earlier, um, uh, around access to the, the, the data. Um, and I know the Sight Lantern project didn't happen in the um, uh, first uh, quarter of, of, of last year in the period being reported on in, in the way intended. But I, I don't know if there's anything that it's helpful to touch on now around around enabling greater access of the data that they hold um if not right now then for us to consider but as i say i'm conscious that is uh, I, I think beyond the scope of what, what what we're likely able to talk about today so my understanding although um i will come back to you is that there is currently a draft report for every district with a higher level of data and intelligence, recognising that Sight Lantern hasn't delivered on what it was intended. There are now going to be, I believe, monthly or quarterly district reports given a lot more information than what's currently available. I haven't seen a template of what that looks like, but uh, there is information on its way if it hasn't already landed with EDO colleagues. Thanks. I, I think part of the ask is is around um, ongoing access to data as opposed to waiting for for, for sort of snapshots. But, um, but I, I, I'm sure that's helpful, and uh, we might pick up further off offline. Sam, the other Sam. 
Oh, okay, right. We're now working. Great. Yeah, so um, I've got two particular concerns. One is on page 123 about apprenticeships. Um, I think I raised this in the last time we kind of went through the Growth Works report, but I'm just I'm concerned about the under delivery of apprenticeships, which is kind of detailed on page 123. But then going to page 136, I think it is, um, we've got some very reassuring figures about how we're going to magically kind of improve all that and it's going to be great next year. And I'm just kind of wondering on what basis we can kind of claim that we're going to have a much better performance on apprenticeships next year, essentially. Um, yeah, because the forecast here is for sort of over a thousand, which is great, but just, I would just like to kind of understand how we can be sure that's going to happen. And then the other thing is just to register, as you mentioned before, kind of the, the inequality across different districts. So I can see that my own district of Cambridge City um, has much less involvement in terms of businesses starting and completing coaching journeys and provide, being provided with growth diagnostics compared to other areas. Um, and I'd be interested to kind of hear perhaps why that is, if you happen to know, um, otherwise perhaps we can chat about it later, um, and how that can be improved. I'll start with the second, um, and I, I will have to get more detail for you. I do know that due to the, the, the priority areas of Peterborough and Fenland, that there is different weighting based on on as part of how different programs are assessed so therefore um, we would expect uh, businesses to have more opportunity to benefit from the scheme because they're deemed to be in most need however that shouldn't be a blanket across all of the provision and therefore that we should be meeting individual district needs as well but I will be able to get that that to you so that I'll have more information it's a wider area than mine apologies um, and then in terms of apprenticeships um, I can say that I am very confident that they will deliver but that would be incorrect um, Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, uh, um, I, I'm honest. I'm I'm honest, and I, I am I am concerned with performance, and they are and growth works with skills are being tightly, really tightly contract managed, and so therefore they have a number of targets each month. They're being asked to put on skills surgeries. There'll be skills surgeries in every district area. They're being asked to put on round tables. There'll be round tables in every area. So the level of performance that they are being asked to to take forward is significantly higher than what they've managed to do in the past. Their social media, they're also, um, they've also just uh, about to go into a contract with a lead generation company as well. So therefore, there'll be somebody who will be taking on the additional, I guess, cold call into businesses to give them a lot wider um, reach in terms of companies as well. So their activity, we are directing their activity to help them to improve their their outputs i am frustrated with performance and we are looking at what the successor to growth works with skills will be um, so we're doing everything we can to turn the contract around i hope it's enough yeah, yeah. which now is great yeah i mean i completely recognize kind of pen, uh, peterborough and fenland do need to be prioritized in terms of growth and such like but i think even accounting for that waiting, Cambridge City does seem to be quite far behind where it perhaps should be. So it'd be interesting to talk about that. And yeah, with the apprenticeships thing, I, I appreciate the honesty. I mean, it's I think it's frustrating with reports such as this. And obviously in a report like this, you're not going to be excessively negative about growth works and growth works is going to be negative about itself. But in many ways, I think it's almost as though the reports try to mislead us in some ways. It kind of it's it's marketing itself. It's very positive. And actually, when you look at the figures, there are a lot of issues that I think need to be explored. Um, so no, I appreciate kind of the, the clarity there. Thank you. Other Sam, again, I, I, have, am I missing people this side, actually, because Sam's come back? Let's, let's go to Sam and then I'll come over. <laughs> it was briefly on that point, but uh, my apologies. Again, I'm jumping ahead of the other side of the uh, the, the, the table, taking advantage of being in your line of sight um, uh, uh, here, um, Chair. But no, uh, Sam's, uh, I think, made the, made the point but better than me, really, that, that I, you know, when we come to review performance uh, a year hence, we're in a better position to understand, to interrogate that and, and, and engage with it if we're comparing performance against realistic expectation um, as opposed to sort of fantasy expectation. Uh, and 
I think that there were points you clarified, Fliss, around around you know what we know about ongoing performance, um, which which is 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 you know well made and 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 speaking for for all of us. But I, I don't know if there's additional challenge we can make around sort of realism in in the future planning bit, informed by presumably acceptance of the performance issues. Um, just so, as I say, to put it more constructively, so that we're able to be fairer in engaging with you know this coming years of performance um, uh, informed by what we knew at the time. Thank you. Noted. Um, so, Liz. I'm pleased to hear that there's going to be additional activity. However, that requires a certain level of capacity to, to do that. Uh, does that. Is this going to um, cost um, the growth works or is it going to pull from other areas that we would rather it didn't pull from? It's all with it in their existing budget and their existing team. So therefore, it's more we're asking for different activities to be taken forward within their existing budget. Thank you. Um, I found this report so difficult to look at and to have any comparison between any of the districts and the unitary authority and the city, etc. because it was just... When, when I have to have, which I do have to have things in hard copy, as you know, um, and, uh, and, and truthfully, I mean, I keep turning the pages and I, uh, and, and I think, well, how does that come? And, and I'm dodging around. I think it's a poorly constructed report because I'd like to see comparisons and sort of, you know, define the data better rather than a host of detail that I can do nothing with, truthfully. But anyway, that's, that's a comment. And I, but I did notice on one page, and in particular, that I think it's page 110 of ours and page 6 of the Growth Works report, there was some indication there had been delays in the CPCA, which was the reason why um, uh, th this impacted the team's ability to deliver the increased job numbers. And um, I have to say, looking at what I've, I've seen and what I've heard about Growth Works, I'm a little bit surprised about that <laughs> because, because I don't think it's, it's been a very successful project at all. And my worry is that, that I, I did ask somebody else to look at this for me. And he seems to think, and he's a development officer, he seems to think that there's talking about job creation targets and that you're going to need to create about 60% more jobs in year three than occurred in the first two years. <laughs> and things like that are happening. So it's a very, very been a very disappointing project, I think. And, the, and, and probably I don't need to say any more because everybody agrees with that. But I do know we have got this confidential um, thing. And I would like to make a comment about that if I can subsequently, if we can just have a go into a confidential thing just to make a comment about that because I don't think I can otherwise, can I? Yeah. It, it's quite, it is quite broad because it, um, it's, and again, it's all about disappointment <laughs> again. So, uh, but probably if you want it in, 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 not said in public, I'll. I think I think we've got a general idea and we'll come back to it at the very end of the meeting, if that's OK. Um, Fliss, I don't know whether you I, I'm just going to say something and then you can follow up on anything that Lynn said, if you want to. Um, I think that there has been quite a broad level of concern um, about growth works for a while. And that continues and it's being reflected back to us by yourself as well. Um, what I'm what I'd actually like to suggest is that we have a. Um, a workshop looking at growth works kind of slightly more broadly and possibly looking at, at growth works, not just the skills bit, but the, the employment bit and, and um, a, a wider range of things. Um, we don't have another skills committee meeting until June, as you pointed out, and I think it would be good for us to spend a little bit of time on this before then. Um, so if we could put a workshop in um, to look at it, and, and I think um, potentially also in workshop format, you might be able to be uh, we'll be able to discuss some of the more confidential stuff that we're not able to discuss um, in open session today, which might also be helpful. So if we could put that in as a 
as an action, that would also be helpful. Um, is there anything else you wanted to pick up on on the comments that have been made before before we note the report and move on? No. Okay, that's great. Um, but but we will try and get a session in on this because it is something that I think there's been increasing levels of concern around, um, and it would be useful for us to have a broader. Um, a bit of time to spend on it. Um, we don't have to take a vote on this because we are simply noting the report. We have definitely noted and commented on the report. Um, so thank you very much for Fl to Fliss for picking that up at very short notice this morning. Um, okay, and we will then move on to item 3.2, which is the summary of the Employment and Skills Board. Oh, have I missed that? No, that is the right thing. The, the summary of the Employment and Skills Board meeting, um, and that's Fliss. Thank you. So as always, uh, when we meet as the Employment and Skills Board, a paper comes here outlining this, uh, like a summary of the key points of discussion. Um, you may be aware that UCAS has now been uh, chosen as the, uh, as the platform for apprenticeship uh, applications. So therefore, to sit alongside your standard UCAS applications to go to university, um, UCAS will be the main uh, online platform to therefore receive applications for apprenticeships. Uh, so whilst I can see that as a good move in terms of degree level apprenticeships, because there's always been such a disjunct between the two, it's going to take significant amount of work to have a look at what that might look like across all of the levels. So we are somebody from who's involved with that work at UCAS to come and speak to us and informed us of their intentions at the moment. Um, and then we've also requested they come back in six months time and have also offered to provide some of uh, our, our advice, uh, given the amount of uh, expertise we have on the Employment and Skills Board. Uh, there was also a session around the primary careers pilot and members were really helpful actually in suggesting different ways of how they could help facilitate the pilot going forward. Um, and an area that I'd like to focus on, I guess, in more detail is around the local skills improvement plan. So we received a presentation from the chamber. The chamber are members on the Employment and Skills Board. Um, looking at the work that's been undertaken so far in terms of the local skills improvement plan and also the work that needs to be undertaken to therefore have the submission uh, to the Department for Education uh, by the end of May. It has been acknowledged that engagement with business has been slow um, and we are, along with many other provide, uh, partners, providers, trying to help uh, the engagement with businesses as well. Um, so they've ho held a number of sessions across the combined authority area. Um, they've also got a survey that's out at the moment, but has I think has had less than 100 responses from businesses across the whole of the area too. Um, there has now been a group established with all the college principals so previously college principals felt like that they hadn't been uh, so involved in the process but now we're meeting I think it's either once every fortnight or once every month so therefore all of our colleges are able to input into into the process as well. Um, one of the things as a combined authority is that we will need to sign off the local skills improvement plan before it is submitted and given that the elections and therefore us not having a skills committee until June, the proposal is that we will review that plan at an informal skills committee with sign off by the combined authority board because we do not have any other mechanism to do that. So I've spoken with Councillor Nessinger um, and we're in, in agreement that we think that's probably the best option to take forward. Um, I can share with you the plans that we have to date and can also um, will invite the chamber, if appropriate, to that informal skills committee as well to talk you through plans to date. Um, and then just finishing off on the Employment and Skills Board, uh, I also gave an update on where we were with the new corporate strategy for the Combined Authority Board and also talked through the new skills provider forum that we launched as well. Uh, in January, which we saw a great turnout, and that will continue to take place over over the year. Thank you very much, Fliss. Um, that's really helpful. Um, I think just to add to that, that that um, 
the, the combined authority board is also reviewing the way the committees work and our committee structures and the governance. And I think the way in which we work with the business board needs to be reviewed because actually I think it would be really helpful for us to work more closely with them. Um, and, and that might help with um, bringing together a bit more of the um, employer's engagement with all of this work which is definitely something we need to improve other comments or questions on this none wow getting off very lightly on this one <laughs> Lynn. I'm, I'm very pleased that you've raised this about the the um, LSIP because it's caused a lot of concern in Peterborough, and as you rightly say, particularly with the colleges, when we all met recently, they haven't even heard, I think, um, very much, but they have had a meeting now. I, I, I think that's absolutely right, which of course should have been taking place earlier. And of course, we are trying to do our own strategy in Peterborough. And what we want to know is what is going to be in the LSIP report before we produce one, et cetera, et cetera. So one follows on from the other. And if they're not engaging with us, that won't work. Um, and so engagement was the thing that I'd underlined. <laughs> so I'm pleased that, that you you brought it up too, because it is hugely important, isn't it, that everybody that people do work together. Um, and I do remember when this when the LSIP came out and how because we asked I think to deal with it in the combined authority if I'm, if I'm right in remembering that, um, and it went out to the chambers of commerce and and and. <laughs> Bearing in mind that the combined authority is a LEP as well, you know, I was a bit surprised about that. But anyway, the fact is, I'm delighted that you're, that you're engaged with it, Fliss, and that there's more going on, and that we can't, we have got time to get it right, I hope, um, um, so, so that we can all work with it. PwC are leading on uh, the data and the creation of the report. I have a fortnightly meeting with them um, and then on alternate weeks meeting with the chamber and PwC as well. So we're making sure that as it goes forward, that we are helping to steer that work. Good. I think we're all very pleased to hear that. <laughs> uh, I don't see any other comments on this one. So I think this is also to note. Um, oh, actually, do we need to um, support the recommendations? I think it's just a note, isn't it? Do we need to yes. vote on it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lovely. So we note on that. Note that, and we don't need to vote on it. So that's excellent. Um, good. Then we come on to the agenda plan. Are there any comments on the agenda plan? We have added some little bits to it, but not very much. Um, I don't see any comments on the agenda plan and the next committee meeting is due to be on Monday the 5th of June. Um, so we will now close the open part of the meeting and move into exempt session for Lynn's point. So if we could shut down the live stream.